What's up guys, this is Ty again. In this video, I wanna continue our series here on Bitcoin for non-technical people, all right? So, in the first video, I talked about the difference between the 1% um, that's on Wall Street that control all the money, that can print money at will without ever having to work for it or give people value for it, right? And how they control the power over the 99% of people like you and I on Main Street because they're the ones holding the money and, and printing the money, okay? And we're not allowed to do that, okay? So, in this, and then in the second video, I talked about how the blockchain works, which is the public ledger that was used to be private inside the banks. What Satoshi, the inventor of Bitcoin did, was that she, what she did was, she took the ledger and made it public, and that ledger is called a blockchain, and the blockchain is updated every 10 minutes, and every time a, a new block of data that is added to the blockchain, right? Um, that blockchain contains all the transactions that's ever been made in the Bitcoin world since 2009 when the Bitcoin system was released to the world, okay, by Satoshi, um, okay? Now, in this video, I wanna talk about a Bitcoin wallet, okay, or a Bitcoin account. So the way that you normally store your money in the regular uh, banks that benefit only 1% of the people on Wall Street, what happens is this bank, the way that you set up an account is that you have to bring your ID, your social security number, your government identifications, driver's license, all kinds of IDs and requirements. You have to be a certain age, all kinds of nonsense to set up an account, okay? And Satoshi, she felt that that was not fair. It was not fair that only the people that have a job and only the people that are educated and only people of a certain race or only per people of a certain ethnicity are allowed to open up an account in the industrialized and developed countries, okay? And what happens is Satoshi saw that in the poorer countries, in the third world countries, like in parts of Asia and parts of Africa and parts of Latin America, there are people out there that do not have banking service. There are people out there that do not have the ability to send money to another human being on earth, okay? And Satoshi felt that, hey, you know, that's not fair. That's not fair that only, you know, we have over seven billion people on the planet and only like over, slightly over a billion people have the benefit of banking service, of being uh, able to wire money to another person, being able to, to store their money in a safe place and things like that. And so what Satoshi did was, you know what? When, I, when, when Satoshi decided to create this new money system, Satoshi had this brilliant idea that, hey, you know what? The bank accounts should be allowed, you know, everybody, every human being on earth should be allowed to open up a bank account regardless of their age, their ethnicity, regardless of if they're a, a, a democratic country or a socialist government or a communist government. It does not matter who you are, what country you're in, what language you speak, what you are, what race you are. You should be allowed to have banking service as a human on this planet. So what Satoshi did was, uh, was that she created this Bitcoin account system to where as long as you have a computer or some kind of smartphone or any kind of device that can, can store a wallet, that is your bank account, okay? So now what, what Satoshi did was made banking available to the entire world, to the other six billion or so people on this planet that do not have access to banking, okay? And this has very big and revolutionary effects in the world. The reason is because now if somebody, if I have a friend that's in a communist country such as Vietnam where I'm originally from or in Cuba or in other countries where they have oppressive governments or whatever, I can send them money and I really don't care if the government says no or not because my money is gonna get to the person that I wanna send it to and I don't have to worry about the government or anybody interfering with it. Like if I have a family member that's back in Vietnam or I have a friend, a college friend that's studying in Cuba, it does not matter if their communist governments uh, uh, do not allow me to send them money. With Bitcoin, as long as they go to bitcoin.org and download one of the uh, Bitcoin account softwares, right? <clears throat> Um, this Bitcoin account software, the, the original one was called Bitcoin QT, and you can find that at Bitcoin.org, 
on their wallet page or their account page. They'll show you how to download it with the instructions and everything, okay? And I'll make a future video to explain how to do that later. But for now, just know that you can download the software to your computer and now you have a, a, a bank account on your computer or on your smartphone, okay? Or your iPad or whatever it is that you're using for your computing device, okay? So now, once you get that software, this, this Bitcoin account on your, on your computer or your smartphone, in the Bitcoin world, it's referred to as a wallet. And this is, I think this is one of the biggest downsides of Bitcoin is that they're trying to get a lot more people to adopt to it and, and it's growing by day. More and more people are adopting it by day, right? The problem is some of the terms that these engineers, these computer scientists came up with kind of like don't make sense, at least to, 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 to a knucklehead like me, okay? Is that, I mean, why are you calling something a wallet when you can't even touch it, it's a software, okay? So I would prefer to call it a Bitcoin account, okay? Or a Bitcoin account software that you put on your computer and install it. Once you install it, right, there is a unique thing about these Bitcoin softwares, okay? When you download it and install it on your computer, it creates what's called a private key, okay? And it's extremely, 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 <laughs> extremely important that you protect that private key because you are the only one that has that private key in the world okay nobody else has a copy of it if you lose that private key and that private key is just a big old long string of numbers and letters okay it doesn't even make sense there is no way that you can look at it and memorize it you have to write it down or copy and paste it somewhere and make sure that it's there okay now and what happens is when you download it on your computer, there's a file called wallet.dat. That file is the private key, okay? That's why whenever you back it up, the, the software, when you back up your private key to a, like, a, like a, a memory stick or to an external hard drive or anything like that, that's what the computer backs up is that wallet.dat file, okay? That, in that file contains your private key. If you don't have that private key, you cannot send money out. You can receive it, but you'll never be able to send it and spend it, okay? So make sure you protect that. Now, there are different types of wallets, okay? And these different types of wallets and the way that you store these wallets or, you know, the Bitcoin accounts um, is for security reasons, okay? Because you are the only one. You are responsible for that, those Bitcoin uh, 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 that you hold in your account, okay? So there's what's called a paper wallet, there's a cold storage, there's a warm hot storage, and let me go over it real quick. Anytime that you, your computer that contains your Bitcoin account, if it has access to the internet, there is a chance that someone can hack into your computer, break into it, and steal that wallet.dat file from you, okay, or copy it from you, and then use it to send money from your account to their account. And that's how they steal your money, okay? So what happens is people recommend, the, 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 the designers and the developers of Bitcoin recommend that you create what's called a paper wallet. What it is is that you take your private key that's in that wallet.dat file and you copy and actually you physically write it out or print it out onto a piece of paper and store that piece of paper, okay, with that private key or that wallet.dat file on there, okay? So what happens is, when you do that, that is called cold storage because that piece of paper does not have a chance to touch the internet, okay? So if you leave it on your, if, you're, if you store your Bitcoins on your account, uh, on your computer, and it has access to the internet, then that's what's called a warm or a hot storage, okay? So if it's warm, it's like it's on your computer, but it's not exactly connected to the internet yet. And then once it's connected, it's a hot storage. So anytime it's connected, there are people out there that are a bunch of crooks, you know, that will go out there and all they do is they try to hack into people's computer to look for that wallet.dat file because they know it contains the private key in there. And once they copy and paste it and then send it to themselves, they are capable of stealing your Bitcoins without ever even touching your computer, like physically touching it, okay? Now, how strong is this private key that is stored inside that wallet.dat file, okay? This private key is extremely strong because they recently confiscated like 144,000, okay, um, Bitcoins 
from the owner of an illegal website called Silk Road. And what they were doing on there was they were selling narcotics and a bunch of other illegal contraband stuff on there. And the owner of it finally got busted. And when they busted him, the FBI and everybody in the US busted him, <clears throat> they arrested him, they took his computer and everything. However, he only had a small amount of Bitcoins on his computer that were warm or hot storage. So because of that, the FBI cryptographers were able to go in there, dig into that wallet.dat file and extract the private key and be able to go in there and transfer his Bitcoins out of his computer into the FBI's account and take that money. However, they confiscated also 144,000 Bitcoins from the same owner, but they were not able to find the private key that goes along with it. So because of that, they can never touch that money. And a lot of people say, well, eventually they're gonna crack it and find it. Um, they would have to spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and hundreds of years before they finally crack that code to get into that wallet, okay? That is how tight, remember, when Satoshi Nakamoto, when, when, when she invented this, okay, <clears throat> remember that she knew, she knew that the 1% the that, 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 uh, that control Wall Street and control the world do not like it, okay? Uh, if they find out that, that, that there's money here, they're going to come and take it. So when they came and tried to take it, right, they couldn't do it. So because Satoshi made sure that the cryptography that's securing everybody's transactions and their money, right, is as tight as po humanly possible, okay? So... <clears throat> right there and in a future video i'll talk about different ways that satoshi secured our system and try to make it as non-technical as possible so you can understand it right but it's tight okay so basically let me just give you an idea here how uh, uh how powerful this security is okay those hundred forty-four thousand bitcoins that was confiscated by the fbi right um right now the value okay 837 dollars per bitcoin right if we take that hundred the $837 per Bitcoin in the market right now and multiply it by, um, by uh, 144000 that would put it at, it's $120 million. You can bet that the FBI is trying to crack the hell out of that, that figure out how to get that private key so they can open up um, the, the, the owner of Silk Road's account so they can confiscate that money, okay? Um, and here's the reason why, okay? Let me, let me put this down, right? <clears throat> here's a fifth wallet type, or fifth thing that you need to know, okay? What the, I suspect, okay? I'm not the owner of Silk Road. I don't know the, who the, uh, the guy is. I never met him, don't know anything about him. But I suspect that this is what he did because this is an option that you have as a Bitcoin owner or a Bitcoin user, okay, is that you can create what's called a brain wallet. And what a brain wallet is, is if you take a phrase, there are software out there that, remember that long code, that long Bitcoin account number that uh, you see on the screen right now? Um, that long code there is my account number. And it was automatically randomly generated by my Bitcoin account when I installed the software on my computer. However, if you don't, if you want to create a specific, like let's say that you took um, a, a, uh, a phrase, right? Uh, a famous quote or a, frame, a famous phrase that you like. Let's say that you wanted to quote Abraham Lincoln, right? And you said four scores and seven years ago, right? What happens is the brain wallet software will take your quote and convert it into a Bitcoin address. Right? It does all kinds of fancy schmancy uh, cryptography and, and computation and it's able to take that, that quote and convert it into a unique address that only you know. Okay, So because of that, that will become your private key. The quote, four score seven years ago, will become your private key. And it's only unique to you because you only know it. No one else knows that that's your private key. So because of that, they call it a brain wallet. So now the information is stored in your head. So what I suspect is that the, the owner of Silk Road, right, he has the private key in his head. He's the only one that knows what 
the password is to open up that private key, to open up his Bitcoin account to be able to send the money anywhere. So what's going to happen is they are going to do whatever they want uh, with him, put him in prison, do whatever. But the day that he gets released, he's going to be able to go and I suspect that he's going to be able to go and use his private key that's in his head, in his brain wallet, and be able to access that those Bitcoins that was confiscated from him. So that is the beauty of, of what the blockchain and what Bitcoin can do, okay? So uh, hopefully in this video, I was able to help you understand what is a Bitcoin account, what is a Bitcoin wallet, right? What it means to have a paper wallet means that your private key, right, is on a piece of paper and it, has, it cannot touch the internet. Cold storage means that you store it. It can be on a piece of paper. You can scribe the, 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 the private key on a piece of wood, on a piece of metal, on a stone and, and stash it and hide it away. It doesn't matter. As long as it's not touching the internet, it's considered cold storage. Warm or hot storage means that it has access. It's touching. Your computer that, uh, that has your Bitcoin account has access to the internet where people can access and hack into it, right? A brain wallet is nothing more than the Bitcoin account that is the private key is remembered inside your head, whether it's a string of numbers and letters or it's an actual phrase or a quote or a model or anything like that. Okay, so hopefully that helps you understand more about how Bitcoin accounts are set up and how wallets are created and what they mean. Uh, thanks for watching this video. If you have some friends or family that want to know more about Bitcoins, I invite you to share this video with them. And if you like this video, hit the like button, comments, whatever. And if you want to get more videos like this, I invite you to go to prisonorfreedom.com uh, slash newsletter. Subscribe to my newsletter and I'll send you more videos like this when I make them. Thanks for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.